as the year 1862 drew to a close, the Civil War had been raging for almost two years. The Federal Army in Virginia was staggering from another in a series of defeats. But in the West, Confederate armies had been pushed back steadily, in large part because of the unceasing pressure and great benefits of sea power. The Federal Navy's control of the sea and inland waters made it possible to seize most of the Mississippi River, to occupy strong points on the southern coast, and to tighten the blockade. Thus, the South's economy withered, while northern industry and foreign trade boomed. In the West, the war rushed to its climax. The Union objectives were to split the Confederacy and open the Mississippi River to northern commerce for overseas shipments. Supplies for the Confederates flowed along the Red River and across the Mississippi at Port Hudson, Grand Gulf, and Vicksburg. Vicksburg, her guns dominating the river from high bluffs and defended by thousands of troops, was the key point. Taking it presented one of the war's most difficult problems to Admiral Porter and to General Grant, who had an outstanding appreciation of naval power in broad strategy and combined operations. In January 1863, their combined forces were on the river above Vicksburg. The fleet included 11 ironclads, numerous wooden gunboats, and auxiliaries. The previous month, Porter had dispatched five gunboats up the Yazoo River in support of the Army. The ironclad Cairo was blasted to the bottom by a Confederate torpedo. During the winter, high water thwarted Grant's attempts to march below Vicksburg and encircle the city. To block the vital Confederate Red River supply route, Porter sent the fast ram Queen of the West past Vicksburg. But she ran aground under fire and was captured, and later, with other Confederate ships, attacked the Federal ironclad Indianola, which had also run below Vicksburg. The Indianola was sunk by a superior force. The Confederates attempted salvage then destroyed her when an ominous-looking ship suddenly appeared. This craft was only a dummy set adrift by the Federal fleet above Vicksburg. Capture of the Queen of the West and destruction of the Indianola left the Red River supply line open, but only briefly, for Admiral Farragut advanced boldly up the Mississippi. Heavily fortified Port Hudson stood between him and the Red River. At midnight, 14 March, 1863, the Hartford led a small fleet close under Port Hudson's flaming guns. Most of the ships, badly damaged, drifted back downstream. The old side wheeler Mississippi was lost. Only the Hartford and the gunboat Albatross came through and steamed up to block the mouth of the Red River. Months had passed. All thrusts at Vicksburg had failed. But by mid-April, the ground was dry and Grant marched south on the west bank. He still had to cross the river. On the night of the 16th, Porter's ironclads and transports headed down the river. The swift, treacherous current pivoted the vessels around directly under Vicksburg's batteries. Yet all but one transport came through the withering fire. Porter's fleet moved farther downstream and transported the army to the east bank. Grant marched inland to invest Vicksburg from the east, while three naval groups blocked aid to the Confederates from south, west, and north. The northern group was ready with supplies when the army reached the Yazoo, and the Red Rover, first American hospital ship, stood by to care for the sick and wounded. After six weeks of siege, surrounded on water and land, and lacking naval strength to control the Mississippi, Vicksburg surrendered July 4th, 1863. Port Hudson followed quickly, and the Confederacy was now finally cut in two. The Mississippi was again a great trade outlet to the sea for the Midwest. 
Conversely, supplies could no longer cross the river for the southern armies. Losing the river and the sea, the South had lost the war. The very day Vicksburg surrendered, far across country in Pennsylvania, Lee's shattered army was withdrawing from the hills of Gettysburg after losing the decisive battle of the war in the East. Charleston, South Carolina had been a primary objective ever since the war started here at Fort Sumter. In 1863, it was the strong link in the Confederacy's most powerfully defended harbor. Across the main channel stretched obstructions and rows of torpedoes. On 7 April 1863, nine ironclads from a large fleet commanded by Admiral DuPont advanced up the channel. They were met by a hail of fire from Forts Sumter, Moultrie, and Wagner. The ship's cannonade heavily damaged Fort Sumter, but in two hours, the forts scored over 500 hits on the ironclads. Five ships were disabled. The Keokuk, riddled by 90 hits, sank the next morning. The attack was broken off. Three months later, the fleet, now under Admiral Dahlgren, again tried the Charleston defenses. Still, the forts withstood numerous and furious naval assaults extending over a two-month period. The ships withdrew to blockade stations off the harbor. To strike against this fleet, the Confederates had developed several unusual vessels. One type, the David, was cigar-shaped about 50 feet by seven, and mounted a spar torpedo at the bow. It ran low in the water, almost submerged. A David severely damaged the North's largest ironclad, New Ironsides, in a surprise night attack, 5 October, 1863. The H.L. Hunley was a true submarine, with lateral fins and ballast tanks for submersion. Eight men turning the crankshaft were the engine. Four times the Hunley sank to the bottom and brave men perished. Each time when raised, new volunteers appeared. The fifth crew was allowed to volunteer under orders to operate on the surface only. One night in February 1864, she rammed a spar torpedo into the side of the new federal steam sloop Housatonic which sank in less than five minutes. The Hunley also sank for the last time. Yet she had pointed the way to the vast impact upon sea power and history of the submarine today. The North Carolina sounds had been sealed off by the Federal Navy since early in the war. But far up the Roanoke River, in another attempt to break the choking blockade, the Confederates built a powerful ironclad ram, the Albemarle. In April 1864, she came downriver and rammed two federal gunboats, sinking one. The next month, the Albemarle engaged seven vessels in a fierce four-hour battle before darkness halted the action. Federal ironclads drew too much water to reach the shallow draft Albemarle. So Lieutenant William B. Cushing undertook her destruction. Cushing equipped a small boat with a spar torpedo in a fashion similar to a Confederate David. On a stormy night, 27 October 1864, he approached his prey, which was lying beyond a protecting boom of logs. Cushing ordered full speed ahead. The small craft rode up on the logs and the torpedo exploded against the ironclad. As Cushing swam from the scene, the Albemarle and the swamped torpedo boat settled to the bottom. Another serious Confederate threat to the blockade had been eliminated. More than 1,500 blockade runners were destroyed or captured during the war, but hundreds of others slipped through. They were encouraged not only by need, but by fabulous profits. Two cargoes of cotton would more than pay for a fine ship. However, the military supplies and consumer goods brought back represented only a small portion of the needs. 
Naval strength assured the North of worldwide aid, while the South starved for lack of it. But the exploits of the Confederate cruisers did much to drive the American flag from the sea. The Alabama, built in England and carrying eight guns, commanded by Captain Raphael Sims, struck northern shipping a heavy blow. In 11 months, she took 69 prizes, valued at six and a half million dollars. The cruiser Florida caused almost as much destruction during two years at sea. The Shenandoah lit the Arctic skies with the fires of federal whaling fleets. Insurance rates soared, and to avoid risk, hundreds of federal merchantmen transferred registry to foreign flags. Thus, by mid-1864, the American flag was seldom seen in European ports. But as the Alabama lay in harbor at Cherbourg, France, her crew was watching one American flag, flying at the gaff of the seven-gun federal sloop Kearsage, waiting off the entrance. For Captain John A. Winslow of the Kearsage, this was the end of a long hunt. On 19 June, 1864, crowds watched the Alabama stand out to fight. The antagonists circled each other, firing broadsides as they closed. The Kearsage, her sides armored with lengths of iron chain, suffered little damage, while her own more powerful guns smashed great holes in the Alabama. Within an hour, the celebrated raider plunged beneath the surface. France had taken advantage of the American Civil War to install an emperor and a French army in Mexico. As a counter move, President Lincoln decided to occupy a strong position in Texas. Accordingly, in the spring of 1864, Admiral Porter embarked on an Army-Navy expedition up the Red River toward Texas. Above the Alexandria Rapids, the heavy gunboats were left behind. Lighter draft vessels continued to advance. Several hundred miles upriver, Porter received news of an Army defeat downstream. Harassed severely by Confederate troops, the vessels retreated. But the river was now too low for the gunboats to pass the Alexandria Rapids. Loss of the entire fleet was threatened. Several thousand men worked feverishly for eight days and nights building dams. These raised the water level about six feet. Then, one by one, the vessels plunged wildly through the raging torrent to safety. After the Red River expedition, the long-planned attack on Mobile, the only important Gulf port still in southern hands, got underway. The entrance to Mobile Bay was defended by Forts Morgan and Gaines. Torpedoes blocked the channel, except for a narrow passage close by Fort Morgan. In addition, the Confederates had a small naval force centered around the powerful ironclad Tennessee, commanded by Admiral Buchanan. On the morning of 5 August, 1864, Admiral Farragut brought a fleet of 18 ships against these combined defenses. The monitor Tecumseh was in the van. The Brooklyn headed the column of wooden ships, followed by Farragut's flagship, Hartford. The Tecumseh struck a torpedo and sank within seconds. The Brooklyn stopped and backed, blocking the column. Eight ships crowded together, a perfect target for Fort Morgan's guns. Advance was possible only past the Brooklyn, directly through the torpedo field. Farragut's immediate decision was, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. Torpedoes could be heard bumping against the hull, but none exploded. The Tennessee and other Confederate vessels placed Farragut's ships under heavy fire, but the Federal fleet reached the inner harbor. Then, Admiral Buchanan in the Tennessee again closed to give battle, and a wild melee ensued. Three large wooden ships rammed the Tennessee. The monitors joined in. After sustaining heavy damage against overwhelming odds, the disabled Tennessee surrendered. Farragut had neutralized Mobile and pinned down Confederate strength, which could have been used against General Sherman, then besieging Atlanta. 
The war in the West was almost over. Sherman could march to the sea, where he knew the Federal Navy would be waiting with supplies. In the spring of 1864, General Lee's force now faced a Union army commanded by General Grant. Through control of the sea, the North had unlimited freedom of movement, concentration, and mobility of attack. Grant wisely used naval power to move his troops over the highways of rivers patrolled by federal monitors and gunboats. Ships are the lifeline of logistics. While naval strength assured Grant of uninterrupted support, the Confederate Army faced a critical supply problem. Only Wilmington, North Carolina remained as a port through which blockade runners could filter supplies. Powerful Fort Fisher stood guard at Wilmington. In January 1865, after a previous unsuccessful try, Fort Fisher again became the target of a large Army-Navy attack. Admiral Porter commanded over 50 warships, mounting some 600 guns. 8,000 troops were embarked. On 13 January, the soldiers landed on the beach north of Fort Fisher and dug in. The fleet poured a blistering fire into the defenses. The bombardment continued for two days. A landing force of 2,000 sailors and Marines launched a diversionary attack on the sea side of the fortification. The Army overwhelmed the defenders in fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat. Fort Fisher surrendered. The last important Confederate supply line had been cut. The war moved swiftly to its end. Sea power had weighed heavily throughout the long and bitter struggle. The Federal Navy dominated the sea and used this control to blockade and isolate the South, to discourage foreign intervention, to stifle the Confederate economy, to seize strong points and ports, and to support army operations along the southern coast. The North's naval strength was no less effective on the inland rivers, where it was a major instrument in the campaigns that split the Confederacy. The Federal Navy grew from 42 to nearly 700 active vessels, while the South fought back with ingenuity, bolstering meager resources. The choking blockade was threatened by powerful ironclads, small boats with spar torpedoes, a submarine, and elusive blockade runners. Destructive mines, called torpedoes, were another menace. Swift cruisers struck a blow from which American shipping did not recover for more than half a century. But ultimately, federal strength at sea could not be denied. When the guns fell silent, the United States Navy stood as the most powerful naval force on Earth. And as the clouds of civil war passed, a greater, stronger, and united America took form as a symbol of power and freedom in the modern world, based on strength at sea.